Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough. In the last episode, we cleared out the crash site of a large scout UFO, we also saw the hover shift in action for the first time, and Andrea Cook as a mech trooper also made her debut, but overall the episode remained fairly unspectacular. Now, to start us off today, we will head over to engineering and begin another augmentation process, because eventually we want to have four mech troopers, one representing each class in the game. Today we are focusing on the assault class and we're going with someone here who has not received a whole lot of screen time yet. Zacharia Rucker here has been with us since day one, but so far he has not seen a single minute of combat action, and as a reward he's now being turned into a mech trooper. Understood, Commander. We'll begin fitting the cybersuit interface modules as soon as the necessary limbs have been removed. Now, to prepare for the next mission, we are also going to purchase a second plasma sniper rifle as well as a second Archangel armor. At the moment, we only have one of each, but running a two sniper lineup can be advantageous in some missions. And well, at this point in the game, money is certainly not an issue anymore. And with that, we can now start scanning and see what the episode has in store for us. Right, so our shivs can now use plasma weapons, which will improve their damage output as well as their accuracy, but I think we're not going to use a shift for quite some time, so let's simply carry on. We also unlock shiv repair now, which allows us to use the arc thrower to repair shivs and mechs in combat, but again, we're not focusing too heavily on either one of those, so this is not all of a sudden going to become a huge part of our strategy. Up next, we then have a request from Franz, who would like to receive two nanofiber vests, and of course we will gladly help them out, because the reward here are three engineers. We also need to purchase only one vest for them, since we already have a second one, meaning for the low, low price of just 10 credits, we can fulfill this request quite easily. The three engineers will then actually push us over the threshold of 80, and that unlocks our first achievement of today's episode, one gun at a time. The new engineers arrived this morning, Commander. We're always glad to have more help down here. Now, there is a very similar achievement for staffing the research labs with 80 scientists, and we will very likely unlock that with the next council report as well. A few days later then, Zacharia completes his mech trooper augmentation, but at this point I would like to save the melt before we build him a proper suit, so for the time being, let us keep scanning. should take a look at this. We've just detected a massive new contact. We're picking up an enormous power signature. Whatever it is, it must be fully loaded. We should expect heavy resistance. Okay, so we have our first run in here with a proper battleship. This is, by the way, the last type of enemy UFO that we have not yet shot down. And believe me, we will need all the firepower we can get to achieve that. Now, as soon as we suffer the first hit, we want to use the dodge module. Otherwise, there is a high risk of losing the firestorm. Activating defense matrix. We're getting eaten up here! Okay, so we definitely got lucky that the battleship missed a few shots here. One more hit and we would have lost the firestorm. But instead, we barely escape and unlock the hunter-killer achievement, as we have now successfully shot down one of each type of alien UFO. Now, at the crash site, there will be 25 enemies waiting for us, and because of that, I actually briefly thought about leaving this one be. Again, to prevent any panic increases, our job is pretty much done at this point. There is really no additional need to clear the actual crash site. However, for our small mech trooper army, we are in desperate need of more meld, and with heavy floaters and mech toys awaiting us on this mission, there should be a good amount obtainable here. And because one of you actually said in the comments of the last episode that they missed seeing Resilius in action, well, let's bring our second sniper with us for this one. That should at least help us decimate our enemy numbers quickly. We will also give Sharky Santoso some extra protection in the form of chitin plating. Like I said in the last episode, at this point the arc thrower is really no longer necessary, unless of course you have a ton of mechs or shivs in the squad.
This is bigger than anything we've seen so far. Considering the impact, the ship seems to be in relatively good shape. We don't know what to expect in there, but you should make your way to the craft's bridge as quickly as possible. Okay, so here we are already on the battleship, because as you can see, the thing is huge. Now, as you might remember, this is actually not our first battleship encounter, because during the Operation Slingshot DLC mission Gangplank, we already landed on board of one much earlier in the game. So, layout-wise, we already know what to expect. Still, at this point, there is really nothing else we can do but to move ahead with Louisa and scout out what lies ahead. Alright, looks like our first two enemies will be a Mectoid and a Sectoid commander. And please forgive me if I'm not focusing too much on the minute details of combat in this episode. This is already going to be a long mission as it is, and judging from the enemy types that we're going to encounter, most of the fights will not be too challenging. And that is true for this fight here as well, as Louisa already takes out the Mectoid all by herself, and before we go for the kill against the Sectoid, we can already move everyone else up, because otherwise the path will be blocked by Mech Trooper Astro Cook, who is going to use her Kinetic Strike module to punch the Sectoid Commander out of existence. On the enemy turn, we then hear what sounds like a small enemy army ahead of us. Still, we are somewhat bottlenecked here, so the only option is to take a look. Luckily for us, though, we do not see anyone yet, and I actually just wanted to move up Andrea ever so slightly, just a few tiles, but as it happens, that was enough to spot the next group of enemies. Now, at the moment, we only have bare visibility of the mechtoid, but we can change that with Louisa, and that gives us a much clearer picture of what lies ahead of us. Nonetheless, I think we have a good chance to finish this fight on this turn. We always have the option to fall back to a guaranteed mind control with a net, but let's see how this goes first before we attempt anything like that. Sniper Michelle unfortunately does not have visibility from her current position, which is a shame, but Resilius is a bit smarter and already starts his turn with the jetpack. Simply activating that with Michelle is then actually enough to give her line of sight. Sometimes the game is a bit weird in that regard. Now let's start things off here with a shot from Andrea, which will kind of dictate how we're going to play this. And since the shot connects for 10 points of damage, I don't think that we're going to need the mind control option. Still, everyone else will have to make their shots count. Luckily for us, though, at least the pistol shots from our two snipers are guaranteed to hit. That brings the Mechtoid down to only 5 hit points, and that is absolutely perfect, because with double mind phrase from both Kim and Annette, we can now take both it and the Sectoid out of combat for good, guaranteed. And that ends our turn, and the aliens do not respond, at least not immediately. However, we quickly uncover the next group with Louisa here. Now, they were only on screen for a very brief moment, and we don't actually see them right now. But that metallic stopping, combined with the hovering sound of drones, that could mean that we are dealing with a sector pod, an enemy type that was not actually displayed in the mission briefing. Be that as it may, we are most definitely not going to engage on this turn and give our enemies the upper hand, so instead we'll just spend the turn on Overwatch. Our enemies do not make a move, however, but we do get a glimpse of the first melt container, so we now have two reasons to head up in that direction. And we're actually going to do that with a run and gun from Sharky Santoso. The outlines on the ground here unfortunately give it away. Our enemies are still in the same position, otherwise we could use the space they're standing on. 
So, here we are, with seven turns left on the melt, and it is indeed a sector pot we're dealing with, and Louisa has the chance to do a good amount of damage. Alright, so two critical hits for 19 points of damage, that is absolutely massive. And our enemies make it even easier for us by clustering closely together. So Kim's Shredder Rocket here takes out the drones and does further damage to the sector part. The rest is then relatively easy. With only four hit points left, we can send Michelle in for the kill. But unfortunately, she misses, so Roselius will have to clean up after her. And yes, five points of explosion damage against Luisa were very much calculated here. If we can heal her before the next encounter starts, I don't think we're going to have a problem. Speaking of which, on the next turn we can move up Annette to do exactly that, and back at full health, Luisa can now dash up towards the melt. On her way over, she detects the next group of enemies, a mechtoid and a sectoid commander. But before we engage, let's move up the rest of our squad as well. Or, in the case of our two snipers, let's get them into squad side range. Our enemies then don't move, which means, first of all, we can now grab the meld. And then Palladium Talpers can try her luck with a long-distance headshot against the Sectoid Commander. And she does indeed get the one-shot kill, activating the Mectoid. But unfortunately, that small bit of movement was enough to disrupt line of sight for Mr. Wargal. So no squad side shot for him. Instead, we now have to use a cloaked heavy Kim Lupai. And she deals 12 points of damage without triggering the Mectoid's Overwatch. And if we carefully move over Andrea here, she should be fine as well. Her shot, however, is not quite enough for the kill, so let's finish the job with a Mind Fray from Annette. To end our turn, we can then fly up with Resilius, scoot over a few tiles with Luisa, and wait and see if more enemies show themselves. That is not the case, but we do get a rough idea of where the second melt container is located, so let's start heading in that rough direction. We will also try to maintain the high ground here with as many of our units as possible. For the moment though, we do not see anyone, and that also doesn't change on the alien's turn. Now, I'm not quite sure if you can actually see it in the final video, but there is a doorway down here that will provide full cover, meaning we can dash up with Luisa to scout ahead without risking detection. She does not find anyone down here though, so once again, let's keep everyone else moving towards this choke point. By the way, there is an identical energy field doorway over on the right side, but the pathways lying behind those two doors are not actually connected, so utilizing both entries would mean that we would split up our group for at least a couple of turns. This one, meanwhile, comes to an end without any interruptions, and opening up the energy field then fortunately enough does not reveal any enemies either. So let's get a move on and head straight for the next one. And once again, our enemies seem to be hiding elsewhere, so our squad can move up without issue. Okay. 
We then hear some noise coming from roughly behind the door, and instead of opening the energy field and revealing our entire squad to what potentially lies beyond, let us instead loop around here with Louisa to get a better view. Okay, and I would say good thing we did that, as right on the other side we have two groups of enemies waiting for us, some heavy floaters as well as a cyberdisc accompanied by a drone. Now we could solve this rather easily by using our last rocket here, but we still have quite a few enemies still left on this mission, so I think for now a grenade will have to do. That still gets rid of the drone and damages the floaters and the cyberdisc, the latter of which actually engages now, but for some reason does not deactivate the energy field while doing so. Now, since the cyberdisc also explodes upon death, it does make some sense to move Annette out of the way before taking a shot. A shot, by the way, that does enough damage so that Michelle can now go for the kill. And this time she does not miss and the cyberdisc goes up in flames. However, the explosion did destroy a good chunk of the doorway ahead of us, so that Resilius now actually has line of sight against both of the floaters. And well, if there is one thing that you can rely on with him, it's that Mr. Wargull simply does not miss. Right, so that's five more enemies down, which brings our total up to 14 for this mission. Unfortunately though, that still leaves us with 11 more to worry about. Now, at least for this enemy turn, no more aliens show themselves, and we can actually notice the faint outlines of the second melt container up high on the platform here, so let's move Louisa up there to start our next turn. That almost looks like a small fusion reactor. If we could recover it, it may prove extremely useful to our weapons and propulsion research efforts. This piece of dialogue, by the way, refers to the object right next to the melt container. At the end of the mission, this will give us fusion cores. However, to achieve that, we don't actually have to manually interact with it. So let's just keep moving here and make sure it doesn't get destroyed. I actually never had that happen in one of my playthroughs, but I think it's possible. A round of overwatches then doesn't reveal anything, but it looks like we might have some enemies ahead of us, and judging from the sound, it might once again be something heavy. Before we investigate though, let's grab the melt, and then we can send Luisa down as far as she can go. As expected, that doesn't reveal anything, so with the rest of our squad we will make sure not to advance any further, and instead we'll just move Resilius and Michelle into what could be two very good positions, very high up with a great overview of the battlefield. Everyone else will then simply spend one more turn on Overwatch. And it's a good thing we did that, as we now have company in the form of yet another sector part. Again, I am not quite sure why this enemy type did not show up in the mission description. Maybe there are just too many different types of enemies and there was simply not enough room to display them all. Be that as it may, after a round of unsuccessful reaction shots, we now have three more enemies to take out. And unfortunately, Resilius only has squad side vision on the drone. However, we might still be able to pull this off, especially if Mech Trooper Astro Cook can hit this 64% shot. Well, she cannot, but she can thankfully fire again now. Unfortunately though, we will have to use collateral damage now, so that we can destroy the power source now, and with that hopefully also the object blocking Resilius' line of sight. And indeed, Mr. Wargal now has a clear shot against the sector pod, so let's see what he can do with two attempts. Right, so 13 points of damage, and up next it's CFD Lupai's turn. 
Her chance to hit is not fantastic, but she is able to shoot twice as well, so one hit is likely. So that's six more points of damage, bringing us into very manageable territory, and Palladium Talpus also has another squad side headshot to give. Okay, and that is the kill already, I actually had not expected that. The sector part's explosion then even takes a toll on the two drones as well. Let's see if Annette can take out at least one of them with a rather mediocre shot here. Okay, seems like everything is working for us at the moment, and for the last drone, we will simply go on pistol overwatch with Sharky Sentoso. Alright, that is this group of enemies officially taken out as well now, which means Luisa can once again continue scouting. On this turn, however, we will not dash with her, instead we'll take our time. Both melt containers have already been recovered, so we are in no hurry. Ready to engage. With a round of reloads and overwatches, we then wrap up our turn, only to once again hear alien movement coming from the shadows, so let's head over there to investigate. Okay, so it looks like we're going to have to fight our third sector part of the mission here. And unfortunately, despite their squad side ability, neither Resilius nor Michelle currently have a visual. However, with both melt containers obtained, there is nothing that forces us to engage here. So let's just put everyone on overwatch and see if we can't do some damage that way. Sadly though, the sector part does not move any closer towards us, but, well, we have all the time in the world, so let's just go on Overwatch once more. And there we go, we have contact and the reaction shots are good to go. Ironically enough, however, everyone seems to be targeting the drones. Now, we have another full health sector part against us here, and it seems like neither Michelle nor Resilius do actually have a shot, which puts some pressure on Sharky Sentoso to do as much damage as possible. In order to do that, however, she needs to move closer, and I think you understand that I would like someone else to take the sector part's reaction shot. Andrea is very much capable of taking the damage, unfortunately she is not quite close enough to disable the sector part with her electropulse, but maybe she can do a bit of damage with her particle cannon. Up next, we will then move Luisa right next to the sector part. That way, she can first take a free shot thanks to her close and personal ability, and then two more with rapid fire. And all of those connect for 14 points of damage. Still, this could potentially become a very close affair. Annette does three more points of damage on a 94% shot, and now it's up to CFD Lupi, who absolutely needs to hit one of her 85 percenters. She gives us even more than that though and actually kills the sector part. Once again, Sharky Sentoso suffers 5 points of damage in the process, but that is nothing that we can't fix. Our two snipers meanwhile can use the turn to move while we wait and see if the aliens have a response. For the moment though it seems like they do not, so let's get everyone moving towards this big energy field over here. We can then also use Andrea's restorative mist ability to give some hit points back to both her and Luisa, while the rest of our squad simply catches up.
More noise then coming from somewhere ahead of us, but we're not quite ready to open the energy field just yet. Instead, let's get our two snipers back on the ground to save some fuel, get a couple of reloads in and spend one more turn preparing. Weapon systems ready. Hold on, I'm not a weapons expert. Things remain quiet for now though, so let's see what awaits us on the other side. And surprise, surprise, nothing yet. We heard some movement coming from slightly over to the right side though, so I think it makes sense to send Luisa out in that direction. Okay, and it looks like our next two enemies will be a pair of Seekers. We haven't met those in quite some time, but I think at this point in the game they won't be that much of an issue. Now, we don't have line of sight with Luisa at the moment, so flying back up with Michelle and Resilius will not enable us to perform any sort of squad side action here. But, of course, there is always the next turn, so let's just go on Overwatch here and see what happens. Nothing yet, so let's get a clearer picture. This move right here should definitely reveal them to us. Okay, now unfortunately our enemies have huddled in the corner here, which means only Resilius has a line of sight, but as long as they're still visible, let's have him use it. Now the second Seeker immediately goes into stealth mode, which means at this point we want to keep our squad at least somewhat closely together, even though I believe that most of them are actually wearing armor that makes them completely immune to strangulation. Still, the last thing we want is the Seeker to be able to isolate anyone, and again, at this point in the mission, time is very much on our side. The alien turn goes by without the Seeker showing itself though, and again it is only a single 6 hit point enemy, so I don't think we need to overestimate the danger here, which means we can probably move up a bit without worrying too much about it. And on that alien turn, the Seeker then actually shows itself, however only for a brief moment before it's absolutely decimated. That leaves us now with only three more enemies on the entire map and not a whole lot of territory still left to uncover, so let's see what Luisa can find on her next move. Okay, looks like the hunt has been successful. Our last group of enemies of this mission appears to be a trio of plain old regular floaters. So let's get everyone in position for another round of overwatches, and everything that is still alive after that should then be no problem. Right, so that is one floater down already, one and a half are still remaining, so let's reward Resilius for a stellar performance on this mission, and then give the last kill to the only person who actually still needs it, Sniper Palladium Talpus. And there we go, our first and for the foreseeable future hopefully also only battleship mission has been completed. Again, at this point in the game, I don't think we're going to take part in that many missions unless we absolutely have to. Otherwise, episodes like this might be the outcome. Terribly long, yes, and hopefully entertaining, but not really accomplishing much in terms of bringing this series towards an end. Another successful mission. Excellent work, Commander. 
Now, sadly, this mission was still not enough to give Michelle her well-deserved final promotion, but at least we did obtain a good amount of alien loot, including 45 units of melt, some damaged alien equipment, and very importantly, two fusion cores. Now, the equipment and the fusion cores can now be sold right away, and the fusion cores do actually make us a good amount of money. Normally, we would now use those to make more blaster launchers for our heavies, but in no small part, thanks to the Slingshot DLC and the Gangplank mission, we already have two of those, so we have no further need for them. And I think at this point, we also have no further need of any more action in this episode, so let's make the cut right here and continue our journey in the next one. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then by all means, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.